welcome back to Peralta's Flex Day. Um, uh, we got lost a little time on this session, so I'm going to let John introduce himself, but I do want to tell you all, I am super, super excited about this session. I've been trying to get uh, John to come and join us for a while, and it just so happens in the fall, he uh, suggested something about AI, and of course, between that time and now, it has sort of blown up in the media. So, um, John, why don't you just jump right in? Okay, great. Well, thanks, Inger, and thanks everyone at Peralta for inviting me today. Um, it's quite ironic. Uh, today, I live in Davis, so right up the road from you all, uh, kind of up the stream these days, but I happen to be in D.C. Um, this week uh, on 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 uh, work travel, so uh, I'm presenting to you from here, um, but very grateful to have the chance to talk to you today. Um, I kind of um, I'll begin by maybe setting the context a little bit. Actually, why don't I begin by giving a little bit of my perspective um, here and where I come from and how I know a little bit about uh, my experience with the community college system, um, and uh, and then we'll we'll dive into the we'll dive into the topic here. Um, also, just to note that um, in the spirit of open science, and it's the year of open science. If you maybe got the headlines, the uh, White House has declared this the year of open science. Uh, these. Slides and findings are um, Creative Commons licensed for you to use and reuse. And on the slides up here, there are um, links to a bit.ly link so you can download them uh, as long as you promise to not go ahead in the slides and ask questions that I'm going to talk about in the future. Um, and I'll try to keep this uh, lively and fun because um, why not? It's better than the other way around. So and um, if you have questions, um, I think we're using the webinar format. So um, I can't see them, but Inger and Mark are going to facilitate those. Um, if you have clarifying questions, please ask those during the um, during the session, and I'll bring them up. I'll, I'll address them. Um, and if you have kind of deeper thoughts uh, that we could kind of explore more about how this applies or what it means and those things, um, let's take those um, at the end. And I promise to save at least 10 minutes at the end. So I'll start talking um, a little bit faster. Whoops, as time goes along, and I just messed up my screen here. Um, hopefully that didn't mess you up. Are you seeing the slides okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so I really kind of began my higher ed career um, working in the California Community College System. So I was the, the founding um, project director for the At One Project, um, which used to stand for something besides the online network of educators. Um, this is actually a much better title. Um, and that was back in the day when webinars were a brand new thing. So uh, I date myself a little bit. Um, it was over uh, about a decade ago. Um, and then I also was interim director for the CVC, um, uh, California Virtual Campus as well. Um, I worked at San Jose Evergreen uh, Community College District, and we ran that as a distributed professional development program. And that was, you know, again, back in the day when, um, you know, we were doing multimedia broadcasts and just started some of the more contemporary technologies. So um, I got to travel and meet people across the state and really appreciate the, the great work that you all do and the important populations that you serve. Um, and so I went from that work to actually working at the Cal State system, um, where I also worked in their, their advanced technology services unit, um, where they do things, they create uh, centralized services um, and worked with Jerry Hanley, who you may know is the, the founder of the Merlot Project, um, Open Educational Resources. Um, and we also did a lot of system-wide licensing and agreements and e-portfolios and other exciting stuff to develop the kind of technologies that are often used for online learning. Um, and so as I was doing that work, I became very interested in thinking about what we could actually not only understand if people use these services that we were spending millions of dollars on, and more importantly, you all spend lots of time on, and so do students, um, spend all that time on them. So let's see how people use them and then what the kind of relevance is and what we could take from the, 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 the use of those systems and learn about learning, see whether or not that work was effective, impactful, and in what ways. And so I've become very interested. I went back to uh, grad school and got my doctorate in education. Um, and I've always, I have here, um, and did a study that's called learning analytics, studying, um, looking at how people interact with a redesigned online course and how the relationship between adoption and use patterns, student demographics and student performance. 
um, and did that you know, fully you know, studied with an IRB and all uh, formal research processes. Um, the other thing I've been very interested in kind of throughout my life is in Latino students. Um, and I've lived in Mexico, I've lived in Chile and other countries and uh, speak Spanish and I'm very interested in especially the Latino culture and the success of Latinos within, within, within the world and within our country. And so kind of take that perspective of always thinking about the importance of equity is really central to the work um, that we do. Um, I like to make jokes. I have a nine-year-old daughter um, who doesn't want me to look at her homework. Um, she won't let me do it. She says, that's the teacher's job. Um, and that's actually just fine for her. Um, I think in other cases and other children, other adults, um, people where that, that won't be as much of an option to, and the, the impact of not having people to available to help with education and design effective services, I think is a much bigger, a much bigger issue. Um, maybe I'll stop telling my joke about my daughter because it'll get back to her sooner or later, I think, especially if I'm talking to people in California. Um, but from doing that work, I actually went to work for, I got um, recruited um, by Blackboard um, as they heard about the research we were doing and said they were developing a Hadoop database, big data lake, and what research questions could we ask and answer. Um, and so started doing that work, actually working for um, Blackboard, doing that work, open science, uh, open licensing, um, and then went to ACT and worked in the innovation unit there. So I've led teams of data scientists and research scientists um, to better understand what we can learn about learning from how people interact and engage with these systems. So that kind of takes me to where I am now. Um, I am a senior fellow to the Institute for Education Sciences of the U.S. Department of Education. Um, I do that through an agreement with Federation of American Scientists under an uh, interpersonnel agreement, um, they're called, so that people don't have to be career civil servants and can come in and I help provide expertise to how we can implement um, advances in data science, especially, um, and in AI, how those can be used, used responsibly, um, and do the research to make sure there's something that um, we can adopt, we can invest in, and we should invest in, really. So um, that's a little bit of my background. Um, and so uh, uh, maybe a little too long, but I wanted to, the title of this talk comes from this, uh, I, I poached it um, with attribution from this article um, that says about chat GPT. Um, it says Google's management has issued a code red amid the rising popularity of chat GPT. Um, if you haven't heard about it, we're going to uh, look at that and show it in a second. So I wanted to think about with you um, what the influence and the ramifications are for education. So um, first want to contextualize this within the community college enrollment, California community college enrollment um, declines and some of the achievements. And then if you haven't heard, we'll play with chat, chat GPT a little bit, fingers crossed. Um, I'll try to do a live demo. Um, it was working a few minutes ago um, and I have screenshots if that doesn't work. Um, and then talk about how these kind of tools and how you might want to apply them, how you might consider them, and then some national initiatives that are, that are happening um, at the federal level um, across the country to really make a bigger R&D infrastructure and research-based uh, set of practices and tools um, that, that we can use that really leverage these innovations in uh, natural language processing, um, in machine learning, uh, data science. So. Um, with that, um, I won't go back to what you already saw, um, but we'll quickly just talk about enrollment um, declines and achievements. So to set a little bit of context here, that this is um, these are slides um, that came out in the um, that are from EdSource um, did research on uh, enrollment um, in community colleges. And you can see here and what they say at the top, um, I have something over the top of the screen, so I can't read it right now, but um, says we gave students a taste of what flexible adaptive education meant and that now students want something that looks they want something that looks like the education they received. Uh, they, they don't want something that looks like what they got before. We have students with rising expectations. Um, and you can see here in this chart, right, that we've got this kind of in the enrollment in community colleges was going up till the 2000s, declined a bit and then declined more sharply uh, through the recession through 2014 pretty much flatline now with COVID it's gone down after COVID in these times, it's gone down even further. 
Um, and there are complex reasons for that we won't get into today, but this is something that really, I think, is confronting many community college uh, faculty members. I'm sure you all see this in your classrooms, as well as our leadership to think about what kind of education will be useful and that, that we can provide that will bring and engage students in our classrooms. And just to mention here that the enrollment declines during the pandemic um, were actually the largest um, among non-white first-time students. And so the change in the decline, these first-time versus continuing, you can see the average change in this, I don't know if it's a brown bar um, on the left versus what happened on the right. The trends were more pronounced here, especially among Asian, Black, and Latino students. And you can see that those bars go, the decreases are in the 20%, 15 to 20 percentile um, range, which is quite striking um, in terms of who this is impacting. Um, and, and that happening with first time students and not as much with continuing students. Um, and this here, and this actually is the Public Policy Institute of California, um, came out with this study that showed at the same time that we have these decreasing enrollments, we also see that students um, are actually having greater success. So the students that do, and whether those two, and somebody else probably knows much better than me, that we have a reduction in people enrolling, we also have an increase in the success of students in achieving transfer. Um, it could be that we have a different population, right? So we're actually seeing that due to the students who are not enrolling or the students who would not have been successful. There may be some kind of correlation there, but again, that's, um, that's conjecture on my part. I should stop talking, but I wanna point out potential relationships um, where I see them. Again, you all probably know this better than me, but the, the success of these students is increasing. So despite, it's not as if community college is not working or the education is not valuable, it is and it's becoming increasingly successful. Nonetheless, we are seeing these declines in enrollment. So in that time, right, and I put it kind of along comes the latest AI to just make it more interesting and exciting. Um, so if you haven't seen um, chat GPT, um, I would recommend, uh, I would recommend taking a look at it. Um, it gets throttled pretty often. What chat GPT is, is it's called a conversational AI. So this is the, the opening page. I'll show it to you in a second. And what you can do is you can type in any question that you want, um, and it will come up with and generate a meaningful response in return to what you write. And you can iterate with the, with the chat, with the AI, and it will come back to you with with other responses and feedback. And this is something that's based in something known as a large language model in which the underlying parameters of this using artificial intelligence techniques to put together and to create and identify relationships between millions and, and billions actually of words that are connected together. This is not semant, it does not understand this, right? This is not, cognition, and this is where we get into some interesting kind of issues and questions, um, but it does have the ability to give naturalistic and natural sounding responses. And so a lot of people have, have asked about and put what they put in and been stating and, and thinking about what this will mean for education. Here's just a couple of the headlines that I grabbed. Um, you can see here, you know, most people are worried about students getting answers from this and using this to, um, to cheat basically on questions and exams. That's one of the greatest fears in the way this would be used. Um, and then there's some people that actually have some other ideas. This, the 74 is a, is a blog um, from, I, I believe it's based in Washington DC, but is quite influential uh, around thinking about new ways to think about technology um, and, and education and policy. And so here, right, the point at the bottom says schools must embrace the looming disruption of chat GPT. So um, now here we're going to go. I'm going to try and do this live. Um, so there's a lot of thinking about what this means, what will be the impact. And I think, you know, the best way to think about this is actually to try and use it. Now, everybody cross your fingers. I'm going to cross my fingers. Maybe if more than one person crosses their fingers, it's bad luck. But um, I'm going to start a new chat. And so um, I'm going to ask it a question. And so I've got a couple of questions that I've asked before. So um, 
a way where chat GPT works quite well is when you ask it questions that are summarizations of existing knowledge. So what I'm going to ask it, I studied social anthropology before education, so I'm going to ask it, what are the major theories of socio-cultural anthropology, spell it correctly, since 2000? Maybe we should say in the United States. And the neat thing here is that it's actually coming up with its response on the fly, right? So it comes up with and thinks about it and actually generates what it creates as we're doing this. So, um, yeah, and so I see this. Um, there was a, a good prompt for chat GPT is a supervillain's diatribe. Yeah, I'm a little bit afraid of putting it in there, but you can also say things like, you know, put this in the voice of a certain person. If you're an author, you can actually have it write something like you. If you read authors um, that um, actually that have had chat GPT, nobody likes how it, it paraphrases them. Um, but as we go, if you look at what, this has come up with, right? It these these are these are real things, right? So multicultural multiculturalism, transnationalism, neoliberalism it doesn't hide from you know anthropology of globalization. Some 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 uh, critical topics, right? Critical studies topics, anthropology of infrastructure, how infrastructure shapes what happens, anthropology of climate change and the environment, right? All of these kind of these are some of the major, but. You know, these are examples, um, but I wouldn't actually really but call them theories, right? But, um, and what I did this a little while ago, and um, was I was testing to make sure this worked. And the funny thing here is that it actually came up with, uh, I said, what are the main theories? Um, and you can see the example here are kind of the classic theories of sociocultural anthropology. So these are kind of long standing theories, but it, it came up with this and thought of it on the fly. Um, and so one of the uh, more fun questions, I think, is to ask questions um, that require a little more thinking. And so I like to put in, will chat GPT replace instructors? Or maybe we say community college teachers. Let's see what it has to say. And I think when we write something like this, you see a little more of, there's not yet self-aware, but quite a bit of kind of critical thinking that goes into this, right? So I like asking ChatGPT about its own use, right? It says it's unlikely that it will fully replace community college teachers. In the last time I wrote this, it did not say in the near future, right? Um, it is not crawling new information, but, and then this is the interesting bit, right? To ask it, I, that they provide automated answers to questions and assist with tasks. They don't have the ability to provide interaction and personalization of a human teacher. Um, and here, you know, additionally, community college teachers play important roles in providing support and guidance to students, um, which is difficult for a language model to replicate. Now, you know, I give this this these kind of responses. Um, I think it's a little funny. It's fun, um, but this community college teachers do a heck of a lot more than this and have a whole lot more understanding of their students. And, you know, in reading things where we start to get quite closer to specific answers and responses, um, it, it is it's something where I start to think like, oh, this is probably like a B minus C plus, you know, but if you're looking for average paper, uh, average papers or regurgitation of knowledge, um, Chappie, this chat GPT is very good at that. Um, so let yes. me feed you one good question that's in the Q&A, not the chat. And it says, does it provide the sources of where the information comes from? How do we know where the information and answers are being generated from? So that's a really good question. Um, so no, it does not give you that. And it cannot do that because it creates them using an advanced language model and interactions on the fly. You would need to be able to visualize literally billions of relationships and inferences that it pulls together. So making the kind of um, the sources, we know the source material that it looks at, and it looks at very large bodies of things like Wikipedia. And of course, you all know your mileage may vary on accuracy in Wikipedia and looks for the relationships between what is written, but it actually 
It has a whole, you know, billions of pieces of information that it puts together in new ways, and it does it every single time. So it does not have that ability to actually like cite your source. It, it develops and creates new relationships and language. That's the way these language models work. And they work in ways to find relationships that are not very easy to understand for, for people. Um, so this is, um, so that is something that is a really good question and it is very difficult to do with this kind of technology. Um, the, with the way that it works. Even I mean, interpretability of this kind of advanced algorithm is a, is a whole um, field in itself, um, especially when we're making um, bigger decisions around it. But citing your source is a totally different thing. And what many people are doing is having students actually cite that they use chat GPT and think about the tools that are used in creating this. I don't want to give away kind of uh, the positive answers, but what many people are thinking about, um, some uh, kind of uh, progressive uh, teachers and faculty who are involved in using these tools, is using this for pre-writing. Um, and so, and Turnitin says they can tell, um, Turnitin says they can find it, um, and they've been able to identify it. Um, you probably can too. There's a certain amount of banality. I don't know how else to say it. Like it, the language all flows in a very methodical, certain way that is very, um, it, it, it flows, it's accurate, it's grammatically correct, but it, it doesn't have the kind of spark of um, what people bring to things and that kind of personality. But um, many people think that, right, the using this and then giving feedback is something that, um, giving feedback or editing and revising, um, and, but we don't know how that's going to affect student writing. And that's one of the bigger questions here and student ability to create their own, create their own responses and do their own thinking through writing. So, um, and if you ask it to, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm seeing that some of the, the chat as well here. If you ask it to quote or speak like Shakespeare, sometimes that's, I've seen that done. Sometimes it gets it right and sometimes it doesn't. And that's kind of the tricky part is that you sometimes, you actually, it gives things that are potentially correct, but not actually factually, not always the case because it's coming up with these relationships um, on the fly. Um, so in the interest of time, um, I am going to um, put, uh, I'm going to kind of move on a little bit. Hopefully this gives you enough to take a look at um, and understand a little bit of what this does. Um, and then you can play with it yourself. It's freely available on the web um, to go in. You have to give it some information, um, but it's a, it is a research study and it's, a, um, uh, it's, it's still considered in a beta release mode. Um, so there are quite a bit of limitations to it. And, but one of the things I thought, um, was really fascinating to me is that, um, oh, we're going to switch back to the slides, is this tweet from the CEO of, of OpenAI, which is the company behind, um, ChatGPT. So, um, and you can read it here you can read faster than I can speak, so I won't do that, but, um, I like that this creates a misleading impression of greatness. Um, and that's what, you know, he writes about his own, his own product. Um, of course, there's rumors that Microsoft is going to invest billions of dollars to buy out part of the company. So there's some good, um, God is the ego, the ego in check here. Nonetheless, um, their success is quite, is quite dramatic. Um, yeah, so it does get a little spooky. I'll say also in my, my experience, if you write in something where you have expert knowledge in or you, you're a specialist in, um, it gives like, you know, again, I like B minus C plus kind of answers, um, but doesn't replace the kind of deep expertise um, that we can bring. But it certainly does raise the bar. And I think that it does um, great. I think it, it really does um, uh, change the kind of education that that what I what I think is exciting about it is that it changes the way we can't uh, the kind of assignments that are provided to students the simple summaries of information is something that is kind of no longer a valid assignment type um, really because I, I think you know at the end of the day if Chat GPT can answer um, that is my own uh, belief that maybe it should. Right, I think it raises the bar on the kind of assignments um, and the kind of educational experiences that students should have. Um, 
But again, how that relates, I've spent a lot of time learning how to write um, and writing early stuff that helps me refine my ideas. Um, how that will impact students is something that you know is yet to be determined. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the um, what I was going to say. What how I define AI since I put you know things about AI here and uh, in the beginning of the talk. Um, thought I would you know start by saying a little bit about how I define AI, which is actually that I don't really use the term much at all. Um, instead, I talk about data science and education, um, and that's something that. Um, a couple pieces here that I think AI is largely a marketing buzzword, um, often doesn't mean a whole lot, um, but data science has this rigor, empirical value, and it relates to the use of more advanced algorithmic systems. Um, most of the people that are doing and funding work now um, that, that I see are thinking about human in the loop AI, where you have humans, and actually ChatGPT was improved because they had humans doing reinforce, reinforcement learning and voting on the accuracy of results. That's actually the technical innovation that allowed them to get to these kind of spookily, eerily accurate answers is because they had people voting on what was good and what was not good. And that allowed the system to learn from this interaction with people. It wasn't AI and the algorithm doing something all by itself, but thinking about AI as enhancing what teachers can do or data science for enhancing, um, embedding and improving what we can do, letting right the algorithms focus on lower level tasks, do summarization, and then allow you as, as faculty and other professionals involved in education to, to provide your time in ways that are kind of higher level usage um, of, of your talents and knowledge of students. Um, and then third in an area where I really focus, I think, is that education data really does need new methods. Um, we've tried multiple times in studies I've been involved in to use older approaches or more dated approaches to use regression and things that are called linear models, which assume normal distributions of data. Um, and in the real world, um, our students are not normally distributed. Um, our students are highly variable and data is very messy and skewed. And there's actually machine learning methods that are developed around that kind of data that don't make those assumptions of normality. Um, apologies if I'm getting, this is a little wonky, but just to say that um, these are some of the things that actually are meaningful and can lead to better results to help improve your teaching is our intent. So I wanna talk a couple about a couple of things here. So going from this big, um, the kind of 50,000 foot view or what is data science, talk about some kind of specific tools um, that you can use and really some pedagogies for putting them into place. Um, and so I, I worked a little bit um, with Inger on this to make sure these were relevant and available to you. Um, and so two things that immediately came to my mind are two outstanding leaders that you have uh, that are working within the community college system around advanced pedagogies. Um, Michelle Pekansky Brock, um, you may know of her work uh, through the At One project, and she's also was it Los Rios. She was in a um, she's a an art instructor as well, um, and has been writing and thinking about humanizing online education. That's kind of a area that she works in um, really actively and helping connect and engage with students in an online way. That um, I think she's she is one of the foremost leaders. Um, in, in the nation, if not the world, around this. Um, here is a book that she's got 50% um, open, 50% uh, uh, not, you'd have to buy the book for, um, but a lot of this is open and she's doing workshops and research as well um, that is available to you. So um, this is here, Teaching with Emerging Tech um, is the link and you can get a lot of um, some of the ideas there. And I know that she's very active um, within the within the, the CDC and the OEI projects uh, around. And again, th these are practices um, kind of like accessibility, right? It, it applies to online teaching, and then now it applies to pretty much all teaching where you use emerging technologies. Uh, so, and then the second thing is um, how um, I met Inger. Um, is from the online through the online equity rubric and again these are pedagogies for integrating technology effectively and this thinking about and this this kind of um is a constellation i don't quite have the right word and brings together the research that's been done around how to effectively engage uh, students from diverse backgrounds often disadvantaged backgrounds um, that might not otherwise succeed um, in online learning and so 
these are the standards that are created. If you look this up, I'm sure um, you have this on your own district website. Uh, and there's been uh, some really interesting work here. This is also recognized and received national awards uh, for this effort. Um, we were looking at ways to think about that this might be able to be scaled out. Love to see this automated into a, an AI system. Um, it hasn't quite happened yet, but I still have hope someday that that, that might happen. So a couple of tools I think that you might want to take a look at, or I would suggest taking a look at, um, uh, one of them is called Quill. Um, and Quill is a interactive, so rather than writing for students, Quill is a research-based tool. I believe they're a nonprofit organization as well. And they really began with data science and research behind what they did. They received foundation funding and support to move forward to provide writing feedback tools to students. So I wrote this in into Quill. This is a screenshot um, here where I wrote, I wish I could write better. Um, and it's got a couple modes available for free. And then, of course, it's a kind of a freemium model. If you want the more expanded versions, then you can pay for them. But um, it allows and gives students feedback on their own writing. So like I wrote, I wish I could write better. And it made a suggestion to say, I wish I was a better writer, which is a much better way to say that. Um, right. And so this, instead of replacing student writing or doing it for them, this gives feedback um, provides synonyms, has a thesaurus, has other kinds of ways that it automates and on its on-the-fly generation of feedback. And this is based in natural language processing um, and understanding. So might be a good, uh, a good tool, hopefully, uh, for you to use. And then the next one I wanted to mention is that um, Turnitin has this um, feedback studio. So Turnitin is known for the originality re report, the plagiarism checker, um, but they've also developed a number of tools like Grademark and Peermark, which allow faculty, which allow you to have tools to systematically give feedback in other ways, have students give each other feedback. And they do use AI and advanced algorithmic techniques um, for calculating that, for helping you save time, helping you systematically apply and analyze student work um, and give feedback. Um, and when I was looking at this several years ago, the adoption was quite low. Um, and so I don't know if people hadn't weren't, you know, were giving hand kind of graded results. I know there's always more tools available than people have the time or interest in using, um, but this is another tool that's available to you. Uh, through Canvas um, and part of your subscription, I believe, to Turnitin Services um, that, that you could take a look at and um, would suggest taking a look and seeing um, if it can help you. There's a little bit of a learning curve, but um, I don't think it's, uh, well, easy for me to say because I'm not applying it in grading, but, uh, you know, I don't think it, it but it is, it is well designed uh, as a tool to, to give that feedback. Um, so from here, maybe I want to transition over um, into some of the national education R&D initiatives, um, that, that some of which I'm involved in, some of which I'm not involved in. I'd say that there is a lot of work going on right now to create a research and development infrastructure for education technology um, that is happening both through federal funding from the Department of Education um, and other private philanthropies. So I wanted to share a couple examples um, of opportunities that exist. These are things that, and, and grant, these are grant funding um, that you could participate in um, and that many of which are still open or will be coming out in the future. Um, so um, one of them is uh, prize competitions um, are something that are happening a lot. So um, the Learning Agency Lab um, collected a whole bunch of student writing um, and they're working on creating and improving methods of giving feedback. Um, and they're giving significant cash prizes. Um, here is $55,000 um, in money for this prize to give code around giving feedback to students. Um, I've been involved in leading uh, something similar to do automated scoring of student essays. We currently do that for the NAEP exam. Um, those are all manually graded and we're about to do a new version um, of that to do automated scoring and see if we can predict the scores that humans would provide and then be able to do that much faster uh, and maybe even derive additional insights. So that's one. The second uh, kind of example here is the, the, the what's called the tools competition. Um, and so it's learning engineering tools and these are done in a number of categories. Um, and this one is going on right now. It's a little late, it's too late to participate, I think, 
from this year, um, but they're giving kind of startup and seed grants to ideas that often require re, um, educators to be directly involved in deploying them. These are not just like, you know, theoretical or conceptual analytical research. These are funding that's going in, and this is funded by uh, multiple private philanthropies are funding this um, to try to help get innovative tools off the ground, things that might not be funded otherwise. Um, from conventional uh, sources that are maybe more interested in um, making a lot of money than making an impact in education. Um, so this, this is an effort that has been going on. I think this is the third year, um, at least the second. Yeah, this is the third year going on now. This is something that is ongoing. And then um, whoop. We, we have um, here, if you are in education research or have ideas about education research, there is an open request for applications right now from the Department of Education. They funded digital learning platforms. Um, so these are learning solutions um, to create research infrastructures so that external researchers could safely and securely conduct research um, with those platforms while protecting student privacy and security. Um, and so we that those uh, platforms have been funded. Mathia is one of them. Arizona State University is another. There's um, several other platforms uh, that are involved. I think there's five assistments. Not a, I don't think assistments actually is in there as well. Um, there's several other platforms that are there, and these are up to four hundred thousand dollars. And this funds just the researcher. So for people to do research using these platforms, and these are people who are not involved in building the systems. Um, so you can pursue a variety of research questions and kind of separating out, okay, we've got all these tools, they do their own development. Now, if we can do research and how people engage and use them, we could bring together kind of theoretical research, people who are thinking about education with these platforms that are being used to deliver education and have kind of some independence of the two. Um, so this is a brand new, pretty innovative approach, something that hasn't been done, I don't think to my mind um, before within education. This happens in some other, other scientific fields. Um, they separated out kind of infrastructure from researchers using that infrastructure, um, but this is ongoing right now. These are due pretty soon. Um, at the end of February, and if you're interested, um, you know, let me know, and I know people that are involved in the digital learning platforms could help identify them or help connect you up, because that's something where you could reach out to the platform, ask them questions, because they have an interest in people doing research on their platform as well. It's kind of a nice partnership. Um, I wanted to note, this is a closed competition, um, but I put in here good training data in the spirit of machine learning, right? We always want to train on our priors, think about prior experience and how that would influence what would happen in the future. Um, so there's another grant that was given, and this was for students with disabilities using process data. So that tracks how students use the NAEP exam. Um, and then to see if they could actually predict from how people engage with an exam, whether those students had requested disability accommodations or not. So trying to get insight, and that's often um, quite challenging and quite sensitive. And we believe that students often don't request accommodations um, because it makes them uncomfortable. They don't want to declare that or state that. So if we could automatically identify those students in advance and provide them accommodations, we might really be able to advance both the comfort of those students um, as well as their, their outcomes on exams. So that's a, a pretty exciting, um, I think RFA, it's ongoing right now. People are doing research in the area right now and it uses this new process or clickstream data in order to analyze that. Um, and so this is the beginning. Uh, this, is, this is the beginning of a, a, a larger body of research. Um, uh, you know you're working someplace new and you get excited about passage of the omnibus bill. Uh, so I was quite excited this passage was in the omnibus bill that was passed. Uh, during our last uh, prior Congress, right before the end of the new year, uh, funding for the next year is, is, is going toward a new unit within the Department of Education to fund quick turnaround, high reward, scalable solutions intended to significantly improve outcomes for students. So we have a new research unit becoming available um, and millions of dollars being invested for new grants that will be coming forward um, to do more of this kind of innovative research um, and look into things like how can we use 
technologies like chat GPT effectively, or in what ways is it horrible and ineffective and biased um, to identify, but it'd be better to learn the good things, figure that out maybe, but you know, there's a place certainly for understanding both, but um, this is the, the beginning of what we're calling a DARPA for education, a DARPA model of active management of high risk, high reward research projects is something that has been successful in a lot of other areas. And um, this is our, our kind of opening kind of uh, start to get that work done uh, within the Department of Education. So hopefully um, if you're interested in education research, I would suggest keeping an eye on IES RFAs and uh, there could be some interesting work very applicable to you um, and your students. So with that, I did save time for questions, um, and I'd love to, uh, yeah, have time to talk some things over. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask you, John, to go back. I'm going to feed you a few of the questions that have come in, but I wanted you specifically to talk about, and this may be sort of um, self-interested in promoting Peralta's online equity rubric, but when we first met, one of the things we were talking about trying to write a grant for is how to take the criteria of the rubric and actually embed them in technology. So right. you don't have to use that example, but could you help people understand how can things like pedagogy and effective teaching practices actually be related to technologies? Um, how can they be tied together? Yeah, so I mean, I think that you know, a good education technology has a theory of action behind it. And so we think about what is the theory that informs the work that we want to do and the theory that and the these concepts that underlie the kind of functionality, the kind of features that are created. So items, you know, like the example of the equity rubric is making sure that, you know, one of the items I remember is like you know, diversity in the images and resources used, right? That's something where you can do image, image analysis is a very well-developed field in AI. Um, they have really good training data sets uh, for doing that, and ImageNet has been really successful at identifying things. We could apply that uh, and ask for that to be run on faculty resources, and then kind of give a report back and suggestions for potential remediation. Again, this human in the loop, right? A person could ask for that review to be done, then the AI could make suggestions and then you'd say, oh, this is the severity of this issue. Here's what I need to address. Um, and, then, and then be able to, to kind of to do that work. One of the other examples is things like automated tutoring. Um, so there's tutoring systems. There's a lot of work and investment going on in tutoring right now. Um, and so thinking about tools to make better tutors or tools to make tutors more scalable. And that kind of you know, specific feedback would be something like, right? I love this when you're giving a presentation about advanced pedagogy and you're just talking the whole time. It's what I'm doing. So it's like, yes, I'm not so sure about that. But in this example, if a tutor talks the whole time and doesn't give opportunity for the students, right? We could have a little alarm going off and tell the tutor, hey, give the student a chance to speak. Or you, know, you could get draconian about it and turn off their mic or something, but that doesn't go over so well. Um, and it always fails, but you could do something like that to apply and do these automated analysis um, so that the faculty don't have to go and do it themselves, right? It can do the light lifting or some of the initial analysis to bring that together. And I think the same thing on writing, right? We've got grammar checkers and spelling checkers, right? Students always use those. Well, now, you know, the AI and the NLP techniques are better. Although I saw a point that Quill made a mistake in the grammar that it used, which is pretty funny, right? These things are not perfect, right? And that's, you know, part of it is like, you should never rely on any tool alone or think they'll always be right, but it's do they help you and how much do they help you and what part of your workflow um, can you can you automate um, and can you use these to enhance, right? That's, that's like how did these help us with what we want to do, not how do they like auto grade and take it away. Um, that is something, you know, for standardized tests that don't have an input into student feedback, that might be okay. But in other cases, the faculty at the end of the day should be reviewing and giving feedback on student work. Using these tools can provide additional feedback to students. So feedback to students um, before they submit things to teachers to help improve that quality is one of the hopes that we have. Inger, does that, does that help? I probably went on for two Absolutely. Long. No, that was ex exactly what I was asking. Just kind of a lot of people don't, um, or Sometimes even for me when a while back, it's like, how does 
how do we connect technology to things like um, a value of equity? How do we actually make those two things connect? So that was perfect. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A about accuracy. Um, can you speak to that with the chat GPT? Sure. Dr. Whitmer, can I ask that you stop sharing so that we can see you and, and the ASL interpreter? Sure. Awesome. Better to see the ASL interpreter and not me, though. I, I <laughs> don't like being on video. Um, uh, so we we don't um, so trust. Uh, so the the accuracy is a, a tricky is very is tricky, um, and that it does make epic fails sometimes. I mean, so what we have to do is to be able to, um, you know, trust but verify and trust but validate. And so using this as a draft answer and draft questions are the ways that it, uh, that it would come up with those answers. So it, it actually does not think of theories. It does find theories. It does find things. It will find items that are often related. You know, they see theory, they see anthropology, and we always see these terms. It will say, oh, there is a relationship there. And, and really what, what these kind of technologies come up with are plausible values, right? So they come up with a plausible answer that sounds good. And this is, I, I have to say, this is where it gets quite scary, right? Because it can sound very good and it can be completely wrong because it doesn't understand, right? It doesn't really understand. It doesn't have cognition, awareness. It doesn't know if something is right or wrong. Um, so there are cases in which it does really get the wrong answer. And so it, it is helpful and useful in bringing identifying some of these patterns. And if you play with it for a bit, you'll find, I mean, to me, I find it's pretty good, especially at like early stage research. Um, what was it? I was trying to think up, I, was, I mentioned I'm traveling this week. I was trying to think of when I wrote this, uh, when I made my slides, there was one of them where I said, I thought, because chat GPT, it's been getting so much demand um, that it's been crashing. And so there's that let's play a game. And I was thinking in my head, what was that movie where that, you know, the, the let's play a game there and it's war games with Matthew Broderick, which was in 1983, so 40 years ago, which makes me feel really old. Um, but I was thinking of that and I tried to find that using Google and I couldn't, I couldn't, it, it wouldn't come up. It didn't come up in the first two pages of results. So instead I typed it into chat GPT. It knew exactly what I was talking about, found it right away, and gave me like a summary of the movie itself. So it's quite powerful. Um, but again, it needs to be, you need to validate it. You need to look at the results and using it, it can't be blindly um, trusted. And again, but but keep in mind, right, this is brand new, right? This is This is something that just got released like a month ago. So as the technology, as they get more feedback, as they can continue to train the models, this will get better. So, you know, you wouldn't, I think, suspending some of that, that judgment, like this is something that is going to dramatically improve. I'll say, I'll, I'll also cite maybe Paul Kim um, is the chief technology officer um, at, at Stanford's grad school of education. Um, and, and a colleague of mine done really uh, some fascinating work done a lot of work in Africa to bring handhelds to students there. They don't have other access to learning and learning experiences. And what he said was that he thinks of this as a new word processor for students. It's like that kind of tool where it's an enabler, it helps you write, but it doesn't do the writing for you. It doesn't create, but it does create a kind of, it does build writing, but it's not a replacement for human cognition, human writing, and the ability of students to kind of pull together material. So um, there, there are significant um, failures in the accuracy and the validity of the findings, again, that, that you need to check. But at the same time, it's quite surprisingly good. Um, and so misinformation and disinformation, Evelyn's question, um, often those are tagged. If you put in explicitly, um, what's the word, like toxic language, offensive language, if you, if somebody writes, because we're kind of looking at this for bias and equity issues and wondering, like, if is it going to treat students differently? If you put in things, if, if, and so we're kind of testing out how it does, because that's been the case um, in other areas where, right, some of these 
chatbots have gotten been trained on data that is very biased uh, coming from humans um, and, and very kind of has racist overtones, it'll replicate that in other technologies. Here, they're quite explicit about it um, and do have uh, guardrails around that kind of language where it patches and actively looks for it um, and, and filters it out to their credit. Um, but, you know, if it's misinformation, hopefully some of that will get tagged, they will filter that in with training data to be able to understand that um, and, and feed that into the model, but it is still a risk. Um, so I, I mean, so there's a question about whether we trust chat GPT to put together the sources in a way because it's faster than a person. Um, I, I do think it does that quite well. I think that, you know, we use it to organize, you know, our thoughts, ideas, and put them together in interesting ways, um, and then take it to the next level, right? Like automated outlines and ideas. But then once you have those, um, to me, that that is very useful, and it does that very well, and it can comb through large volumes of information um, to do the pre-work. And then after that, I think it's quite clear that, you know, the, 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 with the things we've talked about before, that people need to do that final review. And again, take it take it to the level where we add our own persona to it, add our ideas, because, I mean, summarization is okay, but at the end of the day, it's kind of boring, right? I mean, we want to think about creating new ideas and new knowledge, I think, is where um, we get interesting writing from. Um. Let me do a last call for questions into the chat. And Dean Fuentes, do you want to repost your comments about Laney's new program in the chat so that people can see that? Laney is launching a program um, in AI, so he's going to do that. Um, we're almost done. So I guess we'll um, we'll kind of wrap up, John. If you have any final comments you want to make, and no, I, I just you know I would um, yeah. Well, first, thank you again for the the opportunity and invitation. Um, I hope this was something uh, new to some of you, and I hope that you know um, our students will be using these tools. I have a college son, college age son, and he put in some of his homework to see how it would do. And, uh, you know, they are, students will be looking at this and using it. So thinking about how to engage with it is something that I think is very important for all of us to do. And I don't think we've really figured it out very well yet. I think it's not going to be, you know, a replacement for students or for teachers. And it's not the, you know, panacea to improve writing for everyone. But the ways we engage with it, I think, are, are going to be something we actively work on and see what works and what doesn't. So would, you know, encourage you to, to keep thinking about it and, you know, curious as to your, your feedback and ideas about how to um, use some of these tools to make teaching, make teaching better, make learning, um, you know, improve the state of student learning. So thank you all. Um. John, I just can't even tell you, I've been so excited about this and telling people don't miss this session. As you can see, we had up to 170 people, which is a, a huge participation today, very valuable. And while I stepped out of my office and ran over to the Associate Vice Chancellor of Institutional Resources, Research's office, he was listening as well. So a shout out to our own institutional research team that we can uh, lean to and look to in the future for more information. And I hope, John, that you will come back um, as things change in the future. We'd love to have you back to talk about it more. And then for our Laney community, one of the things I think we really want to do looking forward is begin to develop communities of inquiries and teams, work with our institutional research and begin to think as an institution, how do we both mitigate for the biases and inequities and things that happen? How do we as teachers um, also embrace and encourage students to use technology in valuable ways in their lives? So, um, John, thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. And I'd say that there are lots of resources out there. There are big data institutes. These issues of fairness and equity and bias and interpretability are nobody's figured. We're all working on them and struggling 
struggling to answer them because they're really critical and be and you know the work you all do is really critically important so would really encourage you to engage with those folks and there is funding um funding sources available to do this kind of that kind of work um to better understand these outcomes so if you want to you know deeply engage in that i think there are ways to support and fund that work in a lot of there's you know, obviously a huge need and interest in doing so so strongly encourage you to do that Thank you. As soon as we're done, I'm going to run down to uh, Vice Ch Associate Vice Chancellor of IR's office and ask if we can jump in. So right on. All right, everybody, there's lots more to come today. Thank you so much, John. Um, thank you, Mark, for helping out with this. And we will hopefully see you again soon. That's great. Thanks, everybody.